Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Sharath Chander. I'm part of the Java Platform Group here at Oracle by way of Sun, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. It's a pretty memorable week as we celebrate 25 years of Java this Saturday. And my kids were having a little fun with 25 years. And according to them, 25 years is 300 months, 1,304 weeks, 9,125 days, and 219,000 hours. And when you put it in those terms, it sure does sound like a long time, but it definitely feels rather short. Maybe your Java journey started recently or similar to me almost 25 years ago. But regardless, we know that Java literally powers the world we live in. It moves enterprises towards greater opportunity. It moves commerce both physically and digitally. And it moves so many of us as developers emotionally. So I'm pretty honored to celebrate this milestone with you as we all are here at Oracle by introducing the Our World Moved by Java Celebration. I know I'm looking forward to celebrating with you in person, with all of you in the community, and that time will come. Uh, in the meantime, I wanna share some faces and voices to start today's celebration. I am Aditya Gupta. Amy Lucido. Jim Lasky. Bernard Traversat. My name is Paul Anderson. And my name is Gail Anderson. I'm Dusha from Serbia. Ron Pressler. Paul Sandoz. I'm Mala. Keisha William. My name is Simon Ritter. I'm James Gosling. My name is Eric Brown, and I'm the director of the Alice Project at Carnegie Mellon University. I've been a software engineer for the last 25 years. I'm the executive vice president at IES Mock. My name is Matthew Gilliard, and I work at Twilio. I am a software engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I've been at Sun Microsystems and Oracle for over 29 years. I work at Apple. I'm Mark Reinhold, Chief Architect of the Java Platform Group at Oracle. I work at the Norwegian Welfare and Labor Administration. I work for a company called Canva. I guess I'm the guy that started this, this whole madness. Java sucked me in. It really moved my career from Okay, well, it looks like I have to do software development to, wow, this is really fun. For me, Java is, you know, the tool to be able to build and create whatever ideas I have in here. When I finished writing my lit list, I stood back, looked at the screen and say, oh God, can it be that simple? My mind kind of stopped working, so I went up to my dad and I told him, Dad, my jar file is corrupted. He was like, how do you know what a jar file is? Java uh, is the cornerstone of all my career. Java is the passport to the world. I've traveled so many different countries because I'm fluent with Java. Java has literally moved me. Uh, I've, I've traveled to lots of different countries to attend and to speak at uh, Java conferences. And I've met a lot of amazing people along the way. Java moved me by allowing me to join the most dedicated group of professionals that I have ever had the pleasure of working with. Java has really moved me literally. It changed the trajectory of my career. Java to me changed my career in a way that gave me like, it gave me real immediate joy. I cannot overstate how important being part of the Java community has been to me personally and professionally. The enthusiasm and camaraderie of the whole community. I mean, it's really, really lovely. What impresses me most is this large community of developers who are always there for you when you are stuck. I know I'm drawing a legacy of many other programmers who built the very coding framework I'm using. If someone says Java to me, I say, now there's a programming language with class. I say community and possibilities. I will say Java is the mother of programming languages. If somebody says Java, I say how planet Earth gets programmed. I say scale and longevity. Relentless. When someone says Java, I simply say jing, 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 Java, jing, jing, jing. I say community. I say Java first, Java forever. Relevant, that's the word I'm looking for, relevant. So a decade after decade, Java found a way to be relevant um, and stay relevant by adopting to the need, changing needs. What are some of the new features I'm really excited about? I'm really excited about the project Panama. I'm excited about the new six months release cadence of Java. I'm excited about J Shell. Project Loom. I'm really looking forward to Project Panama. Obviously excited about Loom, 
but I'm also very excited about uh, Valhalla. I'm really excited about Java's new features for text blocks and records. 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 Where will Java be in the next 25 years? Who knows? Um, it's, it's so pervasive in all of our day-to-day -day lives. If we keep the current pace of, of um, development, then Java will be uh, a very relevant language also in 25 years. I think it's a very reasonable hope for me that my grandchildren will continue to bring their creativity to Java when their time has come to work on it. I think that more Java code will be written in the next 25 years than has been written in the past 25 years. I can tell you one thing for sure, it's going to continue to deliver value to the users of Java. So happy birthday, Java. I can't wait to see where we all take you over the next 25 years. Happy birthday, Java. Happy 25th birthday, Java. 25 years well done. Happy birthday, Java. Bon anniversaire, Java. Gefeliciteerd, Java. Happy birthday, Java. Jan din ki badhaiya, Java. Gratulerer så mye med dagen, Java. Janam din mubarak, Java. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Java. Okay, that one's out of the that one's out of the way. That was embarrassing. Java, 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 jing, jing, jing. I'm sure you saw a lot of familiar faces, both in the Java team here at Oracle and in the broader Java community. It was great to see all of those voices. And we hope to hear many of those voices again. Before we start, uh, a few things I'd like to share. So first, we are doing this live. So there is no safety net. Uh, I think you and the Java community expect us to do things in an authentic and real way. And what better way than to do this event live? We have scheduled 90 minutes, but we'll definitely keep this going as this webcast unfurls. Second, you can also follow this, cam uh, this entire campaign uh, and this celebration on Twitter. We have a unique hashtag, moved by Java, which you can follow during the course of today's broadcast, as well as after the event itself. We are recording this, so we'll make this available to all of you uh, in, a, in a point downstream. And we want you to stick around because after today's session with our panelists, we have an announcement to make, so we hope you stick around. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. First, we have Amy Lucido, software developer, acclaimed children's author, Amy's also an avid baker, marathon runner, and crossword expert. Amy, I'm going to need help with my New York Times crossword puzzle. Nice to see you, Amy. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Trisha G, recognized Java developer advocate at JetBrains. Trisha is also the leader of the Seville Java user group in Spain. Trisha is also an active Java champion, and she co is the co-editor of the 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know publication. So, Trisha, welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Venkat Subramaniam, who is a recognized agile Java expert, software consultant. He's also an award-winning author. He's also an instructional professor at the University of Houston and is an active Java champion as well. Welcome, Venkat. Thanks for having me. Greetings to everyone. Thank you. And here from Oracle, we have Chad Aramura, who has recently joined the Java team. He's the Vice President of Java Developer Relations. Chad's also a former entrepreneur and also the startup founder of Iron.io. Chad, welcome. Thanks, Sharon. We also have Brian Getz, I know he doesn't need any introduction, but Brian, he's also the Java language architect at Oracle. He's also a best-selling author, and he's uh, published countless articles uh, over the years. Brian, welcome. Thanks, Char. And our last two guests are, were, were part of the JavaSoft team at Sun, and it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Reinhold, current chief architect, uh, Java Platform Group, Mark also leads the JDK project in the Open JDK community. Uh, he is also an MIT graduate, and I think my aunt would like the fact that I plugged our alma mater. So, Mark, welcome. Hello, good to be with you. 
And finally, George Saab. George, he's the Vice President, Java Platform Group. He's also the Chair of the OpenJDK Governing Board. He's also a loyal Duke University alum, and I don't know how hard it is for me as a Maryland graduate to say that, but George, welcome. Thank you, Charles. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. So welcome to all of you. I uh, want to thank you for joining today's webcast. Uh, you know, 25 years, it's really hard to even fathom where to start. But George, George, I thought maybe we could start with you because I know you have a lot of stories and memories you can share, but really, what, how has Java become so popular and relevant for so long? Well, you know, Sean, I think uh, Java arrived on the scene at a time uh, when software developers had a pretty difficult life. There was really, you know, one entity up in the Pacific Northwest that was kind of controlling uh, everything. And so for most software developers, you know, we spent our time writing uh, an application or writing something. And then there would be entire teams of people that did nothing but take that and try to port it to different operating systems or different platforms. Um, and so it was, you know, inefficient for people developing software and it was frustrating for people trying to use that software because uh, you often had to had to wait for things to you know, get around to uh, being supported on your platform. So when Java came, it really solved uh, a, a problem that people had. Um, and so, you know, the result was that, you know, people looked at it and they found this thing that was at a very nice level, right? It was sort of high level enough. Uh, that you felt like when you were programming in Java, you were just describing your business problem and how to solve it and not spending so much time necessarily on the low level details of, you know, how it was working on the particular machine that you happen to be running on at the time. Um, so the result of these two factors meant that a lot of people got really excited and, you know, there was a huge um, sort of upswing in creativity and innovation. Um, producing a lot of, you know, libraries and frameworks and things that people could use and become more productive with. And so this created pretty quickly a, a, a vast ecosystem. Um, and, you know, that created kind of a virtuous circle, right, where, you know, people could come and find that they could get things done more quickly. And the result of that turned into things that even, you know, other people could use. Um, so that's, I think, how things got, got started. What we've seen since then, and I, I think there was somebody who referred to this in the intro video, is that the people behind Java have constantly been looking at trends in the industry and tried to determine where are things going? You know, what are the problems that people are going to have, you know, a couple, two, three, five years down the line? And what can we do to make sure that Java uh, is prepared for that and helps people when those things come along? And that could be, you know, changes or evolution in hardware. Um, it could be, you know, new ideas about software architecture and how to, how to build things. Um, you know, there, there are just so many times over the years, uh, you know, where Java has adjusted to these trends and helped people prepare for them. Um, and, and so I, I think that, you know, what we've seen is that over the years, people who chose Java have been constantly rewarded for that choice. So, you know, the dedication to you know, bringing things that people needed and making them available at, at the time they, they were needed, combined with, you know, a focus on backwards compatibility and making sure that, you know, code that works today continues to work in the future, um, you know, really combined to make Java, uh, you know, last and, and, and be as great as it is today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing just the breadth and depth that Java has offered over the years and continues to offer. And, you know, for you, Mark, who's, who's been there, seen it all, um, has been there almost at, since almost the very beginning, what are some of the things that have surprised you the most about Java that you didn't expect? And in your role, how do you factor that? So probably the thing that's surprised me the most is how long it's lasted. Uh, you know, and, and part, of, part of that is, is certainly due to the virtuous circle that, that, that George mentioned and, and the fact that we've, you know, we, we've very, very carefully tried to keep abreast of changing trends in, in programming paradigms and and hardware paradigms and, and catching up. But I think another really important uh, factor in Java's long-term success has been that we've taken this notion of stewardship 
really carefully. And th this was kind of a hard one lesson. You know, in the very early days, you know, things were changing quickly. You know, the first, first few releases, let's be honest, compatibility was not as good as it could have been. Um, but we, you know, through kind of trial by fire around the, the 1.3 and 1.4 releases, uh, we, we, we learned how to steward the platform ra rather than just, you know, add, adding features to it because, okay, this seems like a good feature or we need this feature for some, for some new hardware. Actually, you know, taking stewardship seriously, thinking for the really long term, not just, you know, what we might need for the next couple of years. And then just you know, really carefully balancing the conservation and innovation in the platform over time. Uh, and, and thinking very clearly about that. Uh, that's uh, not, not, not something that you see in, in every platform. And I think it's, it's been, been key to our, to our success. How do I factor that into my work? Well, I just, just keep trying to do it, <laughs> right? You know, stewardship is, is something we, 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 always, we always think carefully about. We always think carefully about, well, should we, should we, should we make a change that might break some small, small amount of existing code in order to, to move the platform forward, or is it more important to stay conservative and and not break what seems like it might be a lot of code? So I think that's that's been key. Please, uh, Venkat. Yeah, if I may interject, I, I absolutely agree with what Mark is saying. Uh, you know, I come from the other side as a user, uh, a programmer, and uh, you know, I was a programmer using C plus plus back in time, and uh, before the time of Java, languages lasted for about you could probably take 10 years in popularity. And, and for a language to have lasted 25 years is just unbelievable in, in that regard. Uh, but looking back in time, you know, in addition to what Mark said, there are so many things that really came together uh, as a perfect storm. Um, you know, Java is definitely, I, wouldn't, I, I don't think Java would have survived had it been yet another programming language. It's the platform, it's the ecosystem, it's democratization of programming. Uh, where it was available to me when I want to reach into it, rather than being available to some elite group or a university, any common person can get access to it. And it was, I mean, how many of us programming in C++, it's laughable. We all wrote our own linked list. We all wrote our own you know, classes and libraries. And I remember the first time when I could use a multi-threaded library that works across operating systems. It's just mind blowing in terms of the ecosystem. So it's a combination of the language, the library, the platform, the garbage collection, and, and you keep on naming it. And, and every one of them were relatively small, so to say, and something that was available before. But the fact that all of them came together as a perfect storm absolutely made the difference. It's, it's just unbelievable. But now that you look back in time, we can see why that happened, whether we realized it back in time or not. That's, that's true. It's, you know, reflection in the past uh, kind of teaches us why Java is, is so powerful today. You know, Tricia, for you, you've been a longtime Java programmer. And, you know, all developers, we don't like surprises, but oftentimes surprises are good. And from your perspective, what are, what are some of the surprises about Java that you didn't know that you could do, that you really appreciate today? Yeah. The, the very first surprise I got about Java was that it does change. I, I, I really didn't realize this. Uh, I learned a couple of languages, different programming languages. I felt like what you do is you learn a language and then you just use it from then on. Um, but I, when I started using, I learned Java at university. Um, I did some roles after university programming professionally as a Java programmer. And at some point, one of my colleagues said, why are you using a vector? Why don't you use an array list? And I was like, uh, an array what? <laughs> What is this? And the fact that each version of the language brings new things, add new, adds new things, um, encourages you potentially to move in, in new directions. And particularly, obviously, we've seen this recently with things like Lambda expressions and streams, like embracing new paradigms of working. The fact that the, the language keeps evolving and keeps changing can be somewhat surprising. You sort of think that you, once you've mastered a for loop and an if statement, then you're, you're, you're sort of, you know, you're set for the rest of your life. But um, no, Java just keeps changing, it keeps evolving. And when it does that, it, it, it allows us to move with it. It makes us more effective as, as developers as we go. There is one other thing which really surprises me about Java as well though, which is the performance. 
Um, you know, when, when you start learning about Java and you hear about, you know, there's um, an interpreter and stuff, and even now people will say to me, oh, Java's slow. Like, do you realize that a lot of financial exchanges around the world are running, um, are running Java because it is a high performance language. You get runtime optimizations. You've got um, automatic memory man management, obviously garbage collection and all these things, and they actually help improve the performance of your code. It can optimize your code in a way that a human just can't easily do off the bat. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Sometimes innovation can be scary, but thoughtful in, innovation becomes more approachable. And I, I know, Venkat, you oftentimes have to talk to customers, sometimes teach them a, about Java and expand their knowledge. Uh, how do you introduce that to your customers uh, in terms of why they should care about Java even more than they currently do? Well, I'll be absolutely honest about it. Uh, uh, only a few years ago, uh, I was the, uh, g that guy on the other side of the picket line constantly complaining that Java sucks. And I'm, I'm absolutely thankful and humbled uh, to be, uh, you know, to have changed my mind and, and Java de definitely, you know, deserves the recognition for it. Glad to be a Java champion today. Uh, but, but there are two ends to this. You know, I completely hear what Trisha is saying. I, I agree. Uh, but a few years ago, my complaint was, that Java was not changing, it was very slow. Uh, and, and now of course, somewhat of a fear to people is, my gosh, Java is changing. And, and that's one of the things I work with my clients almost constantly and bringing to the you know, attention that while Java is changing and, and more rapidly today, I wanna emphasize this as a very responsible evolution. And, and to me, that responsible evolution is extremely important. And, and I don't need to mention languages. I don't need to mention frameworks or libraries because developers know what I'm talking about. When these languages, other languages, uh, turn around and change things so drastically, uh, it becomes really a problem for the developer community to stay uh, you know, uh, relevant and communicate and continue to uh, develop software. And I'm not just, you know, putting the other languages down. I'm not saying that they are being reckless, but this is one of the biggest things I admire about Java. Uh, Java did not, you know, the developers behind Java did not wake up one morning and say, oh my gosh, people are complaining, we're moving slow, we're gonna take everything fancy and throw it in. Well, they actually took a very opposite approach. They took the time to really look for things that are really useful and how applicable it is for Java community. And then of course they brought it into the language. And I would say Lambdas is a great example of this. Lambdas has been around for a long time, but I absolutely admire a couple of things that happened in terms of how Lambdas was implemented in Java. Uh, the, the Invoke Dynamic was amazing in terms of how it brought together performance and implementation. And of course, the ability to be able to pass a Lambda to a grandfathered a class or an interface uh, through functional interface is absolutely amazing work of design. And, and those are the things I spend time talking to my customers and say, your investment in Java is gonna be long lasting. You are getting the best of both worlds. You can continue to use what you have uh, developed. You don't have the risk of throwing it away. And at the same time, the language is also improving over time. So you're not left behind in terms of innovation. And I think that's one of the things I really like about Java is this responsible evolution that it's taking along the way. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. And speaking of language, Brian, as the language architect, I know you're constantly trying to focus on making the language easier. So what are some of the areas you're, you're working on to make Java even more approachable? Yeah, I mean, it's all over the map, but you know, I mean, what, what Venkat just said about responsible evolution, it's really the name of the game here, right? We want Java to be relevant for the next 25 years as well. And that means that we have to balance um, innovation with, uh, with conservation, right? If we, if we don't innovate, we're gonna become irrelevant and Java's not gonna be interesting to people to program with. But if we're not careful, uh, we, we risk, you know, putting in features that we then will have to be compatible with, you know, in the future. And 
uh, this may slow the pace of innovation. And so we have to be very careful about you know which, which features we you know we choose to adopt. And you know there are millions of Java developers out there, as you can imagine, most of them probably have two or three ideas on on their own of how Java could be improved and. Many of them have shared such ideas with me. And you know, we can't do them all. We can only do a very, very small fraction of them. So we have to pick and choose very, very carefully. And we have to balance features that are about performance, that are about abstraction, that are about programmer convenience. And everybody has their own ideas of which of those things are, mo are most important. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do recently that has been a tremendous uh, help for us is the shift to the rapid release cadence. When we were under the old release cadence, it, 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 were, it turned out that the big features like generics or lambdas or modules had a tendency to crowd out the smaller but also useful features like uh, local variable type inference or records or text blocks. And so we were really over rotated towards the big platform changing stuff and not so much to the convenient, um, you know, pleasant surface syntax kind of stuff. With the six month cadence, we've been able to sort of rotate our balance back to a good mix of big and small features and, and work, on, work on them side by side and deliver them as, 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 as they're ready. Um, so this has been a you know, tremendous improvement and I think developers are starting to see the benefits of that. If you look at the response to the you know, Java 14, uh, you know, pe people are all excited about these new, you know, these new features and you know, we're gonna keep them coming. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you know, there was a time when as developers we were guessing when is the next release of Java? Is it, is it two years, is it three years? And now that we have a predictability every six month like clockwork, like a train, you know, that, that uh, ongoing innovation is something that uh, becomes more approachable and attractive. And you know, Amy, for you, because you've worked for so many recognized tech companies, what was that attraction to Java and what really helped your learning curve? Java was actually the first language I learned. Java was, uh, it was, I learned it back when it was like the, it was the AP computer science language. Um, and so, and I think everyone has like a bit of um, nostalgia for, for their first language, but I think for Java in particular, um, it really felt like a language. I think it was George who was saying earlier that they wanted Java to, to, to not get in the way. Um, like, like people, people wanted to focus on the problems they were solving and not like the nuances of like what, what computer am I running this code on? Um, and for me, that, that's really what Java was. It was a language. Um, I'm, I'm an author and now. I, I worked in tech for about six years and now I'm focusing full time on writing. And I think people always ask me like, like oh, or, or you know, they comment on how different computer science and, and writing can be. And I understand that, but I think I, I've never seen them as different because to me, they're both just languages. Like you have an idea that you're trying to express and you want to express that idea. Um, and so to me, Java is just, it's just like a way of communicating. It's a language. And that's sort of why I've continued working with Java all these years. That's, it's a great story. And, you know, for, for you, Chad, for being somewhat, uh, you know, new to the Java ecosystem, the Java world, I know it can sometimes be daunting, but what were, what were some of those early impressions coming in and how, how has that sort of evolved for you? Yeah, before joining the team uh, about a year ago, I think for a long time, I was with Vencat on the other side of the picket line. <laughs> um, I knew that Java was a rock solid technology, but I really thought that it wasn't changing much, it wasn't innovating, it was kind of just resting on its laurels, uh, and that other hipper, flashier languages may just eventually take over. Uh, but you also have to keep in mind that my impression was around 2010, my co-founder had just come off four years of Java 6, uh, and he was really eager to try something flashy. Uh, but what I've come to realize since then is that this is just couldn't be further from the truth. Um, of course, Java is an uh, absolute rock solid technology, um, but it is innovating extremely quickly and uh, in, it's all happening in OpenJDK. And as George mentioned earlier, it's constantly evolving to meet the, the demands of developers, of new workloads, of uh, modern hardware. And this evolution is happening more, more, uh, um, more often with the six month release cadence. Um, but one more thing that I've learned along the way, and I, I can't overstate this enough, it's been said a number of times, but I, I gotta reiterate, this process of stewardship is just uh, such a thoughtful, delicate and, and difficult process and takes so much work. I've seen now from the inside um, how much effort goes into it. And uh, to, you know, to give you an, an idea of the scale of, of Java, 
I did a quick uh, survey of job boards, public job boards, and I found that 98 of the Fortune 100 were hiring Java developers. Now, can you imagine 98% of the largest companies in the United States rely on Java almost every single day? And the fact that you know, planet Earth is programmed by Java, imagine that technology that's so pervasive uh, continuing to evolve at the pace it, it, it is. It's truly incredible. And, and you know, all of you have sort of touched upon this notion of it's not just a technology, but it's an ecosystem. And we see modern application development sort of gravitating towards this notion of a user first approach, community first, developer first. And you know, at the roots of Java has been not just innovation, but uh, community and ecosystem. And you know, for George, for you, um, what, what's the Java team doing to ensure that developers can continue to influence its direction and ongoing innovation? So we actually lost George. It looks like he had a power outage. Oh no. He's working we're, on we're making on, We're on a high wire, as we say. We're, we're live. Um, they're asking him to register. So give, it, give him a moment. That's okay. We can always uh, go over to Mark. So uh, Mark, I had talked about community participation and you know, from that we've learned a lot about some of the new areas we want developers uh, to sort of gravitate towards and what those new opportunities are. Could you uh, go into some of those projects that are underway that uh, developers should be aware of? Um, sure, it's, uh, it, it's really kind of astonishing right now the, uh, the overall roadmap, the, the, the feature pipeline that we have is the richest it's been since the early years of Java, I would say. I mean, there, there was a, this period of, of, of stagnation around Java 7, but uh, it, it, is, it has really picked up and there's just a fantastic uh, number of things going on. So just, just to rattle off the, the, the usual list, um, we, we have Project Amber, which, which Brian is leading about uh, right-sizing the, the, the amount of language ceremony in the platform, making it uh, easier to write what you mean. And, and, and therefore leading to less boiler, boilerplate. Uh, Project Loom being led by Ron Pressler. He just recently published uh, State of the Loom document, which I, I think is a very compelling read. Uh, and the aim of Loom is, is to bring uh, lightweight virtual threads to the platform so that we can stop writing uh, asynchronous, non-blocking, reactive code that you know, requires us to think, think sort of, sort of turn all our algorithmic thinking in, inside out uh, just to see what's going on. We can actually, we can just write straight line code and if it blocks, it blocks, that's okay because virtual threads are really, really cheap and it's really, and it's really inexpensive to switch between them. Uh, Project Panama being led by Amritya Chumadamore is all about a bringing a better foreign function and foreign data interface to Java. I think that's moving along very nicely. We've got, already got some, uh, some, some incubating APIs for that coming in in Java 15. Uh, also in Panama, there's a, another part of it uh, involves a, a vector API, which is, is quite exciting for programming, uh, programming SIMD hardware. Probably the, the biggest project we've been engaged in uh, for quite some time now, I think, uh, Brian, it's like five, five years, or maybe, is it six by now on Valhalla? Probably six. <laughs> yeah, but Valhalla is a, is, a, is a massive project. Uh, it's the, the deepest cut through the language in the VM that we've ever taken. Uh, and the aim of, aim of Valhalla is to bring uh, inline types, more, more, more efficient data structure, and ultimately, um, uh, ultimately, ultimately, generic types that can that can include primitive types, so that that's going to be a, a dramatic move forward. Uh, and then, then a, a relatively new one, which I just uh, initiated the call for discussion a couple of weeks ago on, uh, is Project Leiden, and that's aiming to bring uh, static images to the Java platform. You know, for, for those who want it, a, a way to very quickly uh, start up a, a, a Java program, um, a, you know, much much more quickly than quickly than you can today. So it's a, it's an exciting list. It's 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 a it's a really rich pipeline. But I also think we, we shouldn't forget all of the other stuff that goes on, right? There's just a constant, huge amount of polishing and bug fixing. You know, small enhancements to to sand off the rough edges on on APIs. You know, based, based on experience, based on on developer feedback, uh, and that happens in every release. And it's easier to to get that get those things out there, as, as Brian observed with the rapid cadence. Uh, and another thing that we've slowly become, in a very careful way, more aggressive about lately 
is the deprecation and removal of old cruft. In part, this was enabled by the introduction of modules in Java 9, where we, you know, we put the, the Java EE components in modules, and then we, then we remo removed those, but provide, provided a way for them to be, to be used, uh, used separately. Uh, and we've also you know, gone, gone through, and this was partly informed by the modularization effort, you know, gone through and just cleaned things up, removed things that are, that are old and crufty that you know, few people used or that were just fundamentally broken. And we'll continue doing that. And I think that's, that's another important for, part of moving the platform forward. Uh, appreciate that. And you know, everyone can get details at openjdk.java.net. Join the mailing list. You can actually see code check-ins and conversation uh, to keep up on all of those projects. Uh, looks like we have George back. You there, George? I am. We had a brief power outage, so very uh, exciting. Nothing like being on the high wire. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, welcome. Well, welcome back. Uh, one of the things we had uh, touched on kind of broadly uh, in the conversation with this was this notion of community. And, you know, a lot of uh, modern languages are now realizing, you know, a developer, a, a developer first approach uh, is important. And that's sort of been the backbone of Java for so many years. And I'm kind of curious to know from you, what is the Java team doing to allow that uh, inclusion of community and helping to set direction uh, in terms of where we go. Yeah, so uh, we we spend a lot of time going around and talking with people, talking with developers, and you know trying to understand what uh, some of the the pain points are that they see. Um, and and then I think you know one of the most important things that we do is um, we do our work in the Open JDK community. So the projects that you know we just heard about are ones that you know we're leading and stewarding um, through a process that's open and transparent, um, and this is I think actually kind of an underutilized resource. Um, you can go to OpenJDK and you can look at uh, you know the mailing list. You can join the mailing list, or you know even just browse the archives, um, and you can. You can look at the mailing list for these particular projects. So it's a great way to gain insight into the kind of trade-offs that you know are are being weighed as we're designing you know the next set of features, um, and kind of understand like, like well what are the things that people were worried about right Why did we choose this design rather than this other one? Um, and you know not only can you see that design and implementation work happening. Um, you know, you can download the code. You can see every change request, right? You can you can basically look at um, you know the code reviews as they're happening, um, and so that's you know a, a pretty amazing uh, thing to be able to to view. And I think it's 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 fairly unique. Um, and I, I think finally, you know, you can for many of these projects get early access builds. Uh, and try them out. You can try them out on code that you have today. You can try writing new code um, and give us feedback. And that's actually something that everyone who's using Java can do to help us make sure that the things that we're designing and putting into Java are you know, going to work for you. Yeah, it's all about transparency. And uh, that's you know, kind of been a stalwart of, of the Java ecosystem for so many years. And, and speaking of transparency, Brian, I, I can't get away without asking you this question. Uh, so readability versus writability. Can you give us your perspective on that? Yeah, a a absolutely. I first, I want to reiterate a point that Mark made about the feature pipeline, right? That, I mean, it really is staggering what the breadth and depth of the feature pipeline is now. And, you know, there, there's so many amazing features in the pipeline. It's, it's, it's actually a little bit dizzying. But just to give you an idea of how big a deal Loom is, Loom might be just be what it takes to get me to update this thing. Right, it, it's going to be it, it. It's it's really innovative work, and uh, so um, you know I think people are going to be quite surprised uh, by, by by what we've done there. Um, so yeah, so readability. Uh, one of the uh, one of the key values of the Java language is that reading code is more important than writing code. And this sounds like a nice platitude, uh, but I think it's actually you know one of the cornerstones of the longevity of Java because code that can be read can be maintained. Code that can be maintained retains its value, right? We invest time and effort and money in writing our code, and we'd like for that code to last a long time. We'd like to get a good return on that investment. The code that you can't read is the code that a year from now, someone's arguing, oh, we should, we should throw out that old terrible code and rewrite it. 
And that means that you haven't gotten a good return on the investment it took, you know, um, it, it took to write that code. Um, and so readability is, as, as a core value, is very much tied to the fact that we expect people will use Java to build programs, not just that they're going to run once and throw away, but that they're going to uh, continue to use, evolve, maintain, and enhance for many, many years. Um, and it, it kind of um, highlights sort of one of the differences in the way that, um, say, a language designer looks at a language versus the way a developer looks, looks at a language. So developers look at code all the time. That's all they do all day is they look at their code. And they're often frustrated by, gee, I wish I could write this code instead of that code. Uh, and they're very much focused on what code could I write if I had feature X, Y, or Z. Uh, we, we think about that too. We think about that a lot because we want developers to be productive. But the flip side of it is, well, if you could do this, what bad code would that also enable people to write? And when the world re-equilibrates, will things be better or worse, right? And so uh, developers tend to focus very much on making their code as good as possible, which is totally natural. We're focused on making all the Java code as good as, as, as possible. And, and that's a slightly different game. Yeah, it's um, programming language, programming languages, programming languages, and it, it can be daunting sometimes, regardless. And I know you, Venkat, have to deal with students as well when in your teachings at uh, University of Houston. And like all great students, they are very vocal with what they like, but also their frustrations. So how do you balance that? What's your approach uh, to introduce Java to your students? But more importantly, how do you help them maintain that passion? One of the things I strive to do uh, at the university is to let students know early on there is no one way to solve a problem. Uh, and this is extremely important. I, I always shy away from recommendations that say, this is the best language, everybody should use it, which is totally not true. I look at languages as uh, vehicles. You know, I may take my bicycle to the park uh, in the neighborhood. I, I need a car or my Jeep to drive around town. An airplane, obviously, I have to take to go to different cities. So there are these kinds of vehicles, and I see languages as vehicles. Um, the courses I teach at the university predominantly are course on software design. Naturally, there's no specific language requirement for it. And the other course I teach is on programming languages, where we bring in about 20 different languages to use uh, during the course of the semester. Uh, so I don't emphasize a particular language to use for the students. But invariably in the software design course, students, 80% of them uh, tend to use uh, Java, while the rest of them use languages like Python, Ruby, JavaScript, what have you. And uh, so when students come in to use language like Java, my goal is to uh, take them from where they are and bring in the ideas of software design into it. And, and one of the things I really enjoy seeing is students would come in saying, I know Java. And then when they leave, they say, I got to go learn Java. And, and one of the things I like to really engage students with uh, is I always believe in make, uh, you know, causing some pain. If we don't have frustration, we are not learning. You know, I always say this is like peeling the onion. Uh, if you're not tearing, you're not you know, really enjoying the results of it. Uh, so as a recent example, I gave a, a, you know, a design problem where they have to discover implementations on the system and then dynamically load them up. And uh, you know, Java programmers in the class said, yeah, we can do it. And I said, go play with it for two days. Uh, you know, time box your effort. And, and they wrote monstrous code with reflection uh, and code that would be unmaintainable, exception handling everywhere you can see. You know, see. And then when they you know, got it done, we looked at it and we said, well, okay, but have you taken a look at this thing called service loader? And then a day later, they come back and say, oh my gosh, we can't believe that we were able to solve this problem with about two, three lines of code. How concise, how elegant, really less work. And I really enjoyed that experience where we can discover solutions. And, and Java is you know, no longer the same language that we once had. Uh, things that worked in the past may not be the right things to do moving forward. And, and I enjoy this experience where students can not only you know, come in with what they know, but leave with a deeper experience and with the, with the knowledge that learning is continuous. Uh, you know, one of the things that you know, I say my job is uh, being a kid in a candy store. That's what I describe my job as. Uh, I wake up every morning, I jump out of the bed, and the reason for that is 
there is so much to learn, you know, 30, 35 years into it. I feel like I'm still a student. I have to learn so many things. And that's one of the things is that all these languages, Java included, offer so much to learn and so much deeper to get into to experience different parts of design and computer science. And it's absolutely a joy to be able to do that. Yeah, you, you, you bring up a good memory for me, which was my father used to tell me as a child, Shareth, you know less than you know. And it took me a long time for, for me to realize what he meant by that, which is every day is an opportunity to learn something new. And I know in the Java ecosystem, there's always something new we can learn. Uh, and that learning also brings us, you know, closer to community. And, you know, Chad, I'd like to ask you, you know, kind of, you know, what's your uh, perceptions around community? And why do you believe it's so important for the success of Java? Well, first I want to say, Venkat, I felt a lot of that pain in my engineering courses back in college. And, and now I know why, because the teachers are trying to cause pain. Uh, <laughs> all, all these years, and I'm just figuring that out now. Uh, well, Shar, yeah, I mean, lots of us have talked about community today. Uh, it's pretty much your middle name, right? Might be, I think something along those lines. <laughs> well, Java is, you know, much more than just a technology. It's truly an open platform guided by a community of developers, students, teachers, speakers, authors, uh, and on and on. Um, we tried to capture this in the Moved by Java video series at the beginning of this session, uh, really tried to, to capture the spirit of the community um, with a small yet mighty uh, group. And uh, I think this is really something that sets Java apart. Um, and I think the reason is because community is just part of the ethos of Java. Um, I believe it was one of the original core values, in fact. And so you can tell that this is, or keeping Java vibrant is just part of the ethos and it's woven in the fabric of, of Java for all these years. Uh, and even today, you know, for example, with the uh, video series, uh, the whole Moved by Java campaign, the intention is to really try and capture that experience that Java is, is such a rock solid platform and technology, but it's so much more. Um, and for, for a quarter of a century, we want to showcase that diversity, the scale, and the warmness of the community. Um, it's truly embraced me, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it now. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Community does definitely bring a sense of approachability uh, to the technology. And, you know, getting back a little bit on the technical side, that in that same lens in terms of approachability, Trisha, being a tooling expert, why, why is tooling so important for Java developers? Well, since I work for an IDE firm, obviously I'm going to say your IDE is your most important tool. <laughs> um, but tooling, like you say, tooling is super important, and particularly around addressing issues like what Brian was talking about in terms of readability. You don't have to bake a certain level of readability into the language if your tooling, like your IDE, can help you with readability, with navig navigability, and um, with these sorts of things. For example, before Java 8 came out, IntelliJ IDEA could display anonymous inner classes as if they were a Lambda expression, even though they weren't. So your, your tooling can kind of help you help bridge the gap between kind of what you want and what the language provides, particularly in terms of your IDE. But tooling isn't just the IDE, obviously, it's things like um, your, your, your libraries, your frameworks, um, even other JVM languages. Um, and a lot of that, uh, a lot of the approachability of Java comes from that, from the, like we said, the, the frameworks and languages. And of course, this comes back to Chad's point about community. A lot of that is driven by the community, the open source community in particular, for example, creating languages and, and uh, libraries that we as developers can easily use. We don't have to rewrite stuff from scratch. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's all there for us. That's why Java is so approachable. A lot of the stuff, we just kind of take it off the shelf. We don't write a linked list or a class every single time. And on top of that, being 25 years old means that not only do we have these tools, but we've got blog posts and tutorials and people to speak to. So a lot of this is around, obviously, the tools, the technical tools, but combined with the power of the community and the people involved in the community, that is what's really making Java approachable. I don't just have to read uh, the Java doc or, or the language specification. I can read someone's personal experience of how they got this working, of, of the problems they faced. Oh, it's not me being stupid. It's just a bit of a difficult thing to do. So tooling combined with community is like a very large part of the, of the power of Java. Yeah, it's, that's so true because, you know, the, the power of technology, the power of ecosystem, the power of community just drives our passion further. And, you know, for Amy, uh, your Java passion led you to publish a book last year. Could you tell us a little bit about that book and uh, how it relates to Java? 
Yeah. So, um, so the book is called Emmy and the Key of Code. I very conveniently have it right here. Wait, oh, um, hold on. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I have my copy um, too. <laughs> so the concept of the book, it's about a 12 year old girl named Emmy who comes from a family of musicians. Her mom is an opera singer. Her dad plays piano. Um, and as much as she loves music and as much as she thinks in music, she doesn't feel like she's good at actually making music. Um, and so when her, she moves to San Francisco for her dad's job, she decides, you know what, I'm, I'm done trying to be a musician. I'm not good at it. I'm gonna do something totally different. I'm gonna try software engineering. And so she takes a computer science class, which is coincidentally in Java, because that was the language that I learned to code in. Um, and not only does she kind of fall in love with coding, but she actually falls in love with it through music, which is the language that she's familiar with. So the, the way that this relates to Java, in addition to you know the main character, Emmy, learning Java in our class, is that the story is actually written in this combination of poetry and computer code. So because Emmy's a musician, um, the book starts out written in this sort of very slight, very um, sparse poetic format. So it's called a novel in verse because the entire story is told in verse. Um, but as the main character learns how to code in Java, the poetry starts to actually um, include the if statements and while loops and sort of a basic, you know, sixth graders understanding of um, what Java is. And so as the book progresses, there starts to be, I don't know how easy it is to see, but you can, so you start to see some, uh, some strings you see some some curly braces, some semicolons. She starts to think in variables, um, if statements, while loops, um, and so the idea is a kid that's reading the book would um, would sort of read it for the story, but accidentally learn a little bit of coding along the way. And I think this, and I think the reason that this needed to be told in Java, in addition to sort of Java being the language that I learned to code in, um, is because Java is so readable. We were talking earlier about how. Um, Java isn't just for code writing, it's for code reading. And I think that's why it had to be Java because Java is so human readable. I think, um, I think people that don't code, especially, you know, I think kids now are becoming more and more tech savvy. Um, but I think a lot of people, when they think about code, they think about like ones and zeros and like the matrix. And, you know, it's like only a genius could understand the secret message that's hidden in the code. But like they don't realize that code is English. You know, well-written code should be completely human readable, and Java so often is entirely human readable. And I think people actually feel very similarly about poetry. They think it's this like scary thing that people can't understand. So I figured, why not combine the two in a way that's very understandable? That's that's written literally for for twelve-year-olds. Um, that where where kids will read it, fall in love with coding, fall in love with poetry, fall in love with Java. And, uh, and then go off and build incredible things. And I've actually had people reach out to me, total strangers saying that, um, that their kid wants to learn Java now, just like Emmy, because, and they'll ask me like, like, oh, what IDE is Emmy using? Like, like oh, like, you, you know, all this stuff. And I, <laughs> and I, I kind of made up an, an IDE specifically in the book, but, um, but it's just funny, kids are so inspired to learn Java now because, because they read a story where they realized code doesn't have to be scary. It can be fun and readable. Yep. Uh, in fact, maybe the, the second book, the follow-up will, you and Trisha can collaborate and, it'll, and uh, the character can use uh, yeah, and, breaks, exactly. ID for that. But quick, quick question for all the panelists. Does everyone have a copy of the book? Of course. The, the, right, the right answer Thank is uh, yes, we all do. So Amy, where, where can people get a copy? It's available wherever books are sold. So that means like Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target. But I know, um, especially because a lot of small bookstores are having trouble staying afloat right now because they're losing full foot traffic due to the Corona stuff. Um, it would be really great if you could support your local independent bookstore. So if you do live in San Francisco, some great ones that I recommend are Booksmith. That's where I have my launch. If you live in the South Bay, Kepler's is a great bookstore. Um, but a lot of your independent bookstores are doing online orders right now. Um, and so, so I think they would love your support, but you know, it's available wherever books are sold. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and, and that's actually a, a good lead into um, just this whole notion of the Moved by Java campaign, because all of you have your own fondest memories. And I'd like to know how each of you are moved by Java. And I thought we could have each of you kind of share your personal memories. And, you know, Chad, I thought we could start with you. Yeah, mine's easy. Uh, I think it was Code One Java Keynote 2017. 
um, we, we, uh, we launched the FN project on stage uh, live. And at the end, we uh, actually went into the danger zone of GitHub and, uh, and hit make public. But in rehearsals, it worked fine. I made it public and made it private really quickly. But this time, um, GitHub decided to give me a two-factor off warning. And so on stage, in front of a few thousand people who I could actually see, so it's much more embarrassing, uh, you can't tell on the video, but I'm totally sweating bullets. Uh, and I'm freaking out. But luckily, I had my phone in my pocket, which I wasn't planning on doing. And even though I didn't have uh, a reception, I had one password. And so I was able to really quickly get the 2FA code from one password and it happened to work. Uh, and then I saw a tweet a little later that said, best advertisement for one password ever saves Keynote. <laughs> and so uh, that was definitely one of my fondest memories. And I also, what I didn't know at the time is uh, I wasn't part of the Java team yet, uh, but I got to work with many of you, including yourself, Char and George and Mark. And, uh, and the wheels were sort of set in motion for me to eventually join. And so I'm really excited to be here now. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have, have you part of the team and the fresh perspective that you bring, as, bring in as well. And uh, there's nothing like deploying a product live on stage and having it be event-driven release cycles. So uh, not, I'm not saying that's what we're going to start doing in the future, though. So, um, Trisha, how about you? How have you been moved by Java? And so, uh, not to copy you, Chad, but mine is also a, a Java one, not code one now, but a Java one story. So Java one, 2011, it was um, only the second conference I'd ever been to. It was the first time I was going to present at a conference. Um, I was co-presenting with my boss's boss, Martin Thompson. And um, so I was lucky enough to be at Java one with, um, with Martin Thompson, um, who's another Java champion, with Martin Verberg, who's also a Java champion from the London Java community. And because they were connected into the community, they kind of introduced me to a lot of people um, at Java One. Um, I don't think I met Mark and Brian that year, but I definitely saw them presenting on stage. And through a lot of this, meeting people um, who are now well-known Java champions and through people meeting people from the, from the JCP um, and things like that, I came to realize that Java is not just a language that I code in. It's not just um, a day job, which I've been doing for sort of 10 years or more. Um, it's, it is this community idea and community is not some sort of nebulous thing. It's made of individual people, individual people you can meet and talk to and, and get to know and ask questions like, um, why does it work that like that <laughs> what's the, why was it done like this and um and not only that but the people were super welcoming like really um it can be intimidating being a, a big conference particularly if you're if you're a woman in technology and everyone there was like super helpful and embracing and um and that just changed the way that my whole career went from there i ended up becoming a developer advocate became a java champion and just became like part of this amazing community yeah, you know, sometimes that gets lost in that, you know, a lot of perceptions are that community is about agreement, but a lot of times I find that community is about disagreement and finding common ground that we can move forward together. So, you know, that's one of the things that I, I really love about the Java ecosystem is we have agreement and disagreement and we, we find ways to work to, uh, with each other. George, how about you? How have you been moved by Java? Uh, you know, I'm also going to reach back into the past for a Java One memory. Um, mine is actually from 1997, uh, when when this T-shirt was fairly new. <laughs> um, and you know, at that time, uh, we were working on uh, 1.2, and uh, I was involved in uh, you know the group that created uh, Swing. Um, in fact, I named it. The marketing folks have never forgive me, uh, forgiven me since. Uh, but, uh, but that was, that was a fun story. Um, but we had a lot of fun working on the proof of concept, uh, for swing. This was sort of, you know, when we were launching the project that eventually, you know, produced swing. Um, and there were a bunch of people involved in that, uh, in time at the time we had, we'd been working on AWT and we're going to start working on, on this new project. Um, and we got a lot of help, uh, actually from James Gosling, uh, himself who joined us and, and worked on, on this proof of concept. Um, and the idea of this, it was sort of uh, a, a demo, and basically we were trying to show, uh, you know, the idea of a pluggable look and feel. Um, and so what we did, Amy, like this, uh, was we put something together that would allow you to look at uh, sort of music, and then it had a jazz themed, a rock themed, and a classical themed uh, look and feel that you could, you know, swap in and out. 
Um, and so uh, that actually ended up being shown uh, in, in the keynote in Java One in 1997. And there was a funny story. One of, the, one of my colleagues who was working on it um, had spent his time at college um, you know, as an aspiring rock musician. And he said, you know, his dream was always to stand up on stage in front of, you know, thousands of screaming fans, you know, showing his art. Uh, and he said, you know, sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for because, you know, you actually get it, but in a totally different way from what you, what you were expecting. Um, so, uh, so that was quite fun. And then, you know, since then, I've just, uh, I've had so many opportunities to travel around the world and, you know, be on stage and, and talk with people, you know, user groups in, you know, Brazil, in Japan. Um, in all parts of Europe and you know, it is every time, you know, I come away with memories that are, are, are just priceless. Uh, those, those, those are priceless memories. A Amy, what about for you? Um, so I'm also going to reach back to my favorite Java memory, uh, but, but first I just want to say I love, I love that people are making music with Java. I think, I think people sometimes forget how, what a wide range of things you can create with, with, with code and with Java in particular. So I absolutely love that. Um, and speaking of music with code, um, I think there's a lot of different ways to make music with code. I think there, the obvious one is that you're, you know, building some kind of machine that creates music or that creates art. But I think the language itself can be musical. Um, and so um, when I was first learning how to code, like, you know, day one of my Java class, um, I, had a, I had a really wonderful computer science teacher who, who understood that the people in that class and like myself in particular, were not good at, at, um, at, at doing things they didn't understand. Like we needed to understand every single element of something before we felt comfortable doing it. And so, but when you're first learning to code, that's not really how it works. Like you kind of have to trust that, that the things your teacher tells you to type are going to work and then event like as time goes on you'll you'll kind of you know understand it more and more and so with java there's a very famous bit of boilerplate that i think every single person in this room has typed just like a million times that they can you know sing it in their sleep um and so but but at the at the you know and of course that uh that bit of boilerplate is public static void main string bracket bracket arcs um but uh as a as a new coder i i was terrified of this bit of code because i didn't know what it meant and so my teacher was like you know what i understand that you're not going to get it right away so just memorize it like music and so then he he wrapped it to us and i will never forget it because it was so funny it was so great and i'm going to wrap it for you now so bear with me um so he's saying it like this public static void mainstream bracket bracket arts and I thought this was fantastic. And now every single time I type those words, I sing it to myself because it really did. It felt, it felt like music. And then of course, as time went on, I went and I understood every single word. Um, but so I, I include this in the book because I feel like, uh, like there are so many ways to think about the music of code. You can think of it as, you know, like, like the sounds that you make when you type, because that, that, that feels like playing a piano there. You can literally make computer generated music um, and actually one of the first pieces of code I ever wrote as like a really little kid even before um, I was using like a real programming language was a was a virtual keyboard where like you click a button and it plays a song like on like on the piano um, so like so there's so many ways to make music but I think one of them is the language itself you know we sort of we develop such an emotional attachment to it to the like the specific words that it starts to feel like a song to us and so that's one of my favorite memories was my teacher rapping that, public static void range during bracket bracket args. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to try in even attempt to rap that. I don't think we want anyone to try that, but could, could, could you do that again? That was pretty cool. <laughs> Absolutely. As many times as you want. All right. Public static void mainstream bracket bracket args. <laughs> that's, that's, that's amazing. And you know, Amy, you brought up uh, a memory for me. Um, and some of you out there might know Sam Aaron. Uh, he actually has a project called Sonic Pi. So he teaches kids how to program through the notion of, of music as well. Uh, the best part is it's rave music. I, I love techno, so yay, Sam. Um, but Amy, I thought you might uh, like to look at that project as well, but it's called Sonic Pi. That's so cool. I'll have to check it out. Absolutely. Benkett, what about for you? Uh, some memories for you that uh, where you were moved by Java. Oh, there are several of them, but one that I am uh, absolutely excited about is uh, a, a project I was working on for a client. And in this particular case, we found that 
we have to do several billions of computations. So it was pretty computation intensive. And the domain experts would give us mathematical equations that we need to read from Excel spreadsheet and execute it. Uh, so after several days of uh, design with the team of uh, lead developers, we were uh, you know, thinking about how to solve it. And then we decided to use uh, Lambda expressions. Now, obviously one of the concerns a lot of developers often have is the P word, what about performance? So what we had done was we wrapped these equations on the fly into lambdas. And one of the requirements was to use memoization. So if a computation were computed successfully, at that point, we need to replace the equation with the value that was computed. Uh, so after a few uh, days of effort, uh, we implemented this using lambdas. And when we executed it, uh, we were blown away to see uh, how it stood up to performance where we had these billions of computations. Uh, so it actually took me a couple of days to uh, really kind of come to grips with, we have implemented something that's absolutely phenomenal. And not only was it a great idea in concept and design, but it's something that stood up to performance as well. So that was one of the big successes to show that these ideas can be actually implemented, not just in concept, but in performance as well. And I thought that was a pretty big win. That's a good segue. Brian, how about you? Yeah, so I, I, I want to go way back uh, to like the very early days of Java. So 1996 timeframe, uh, when I first started programming Java. And at the time, I had programmed in dozens of languages. And that was that was normal at the time is that developers were expected to know a lot of different languages. I, I was mostly doing work in C at the time, but I picked up a few projects in Java. And, uh, you know, like, um, I, I think like many developers, the experience of programming in C is a uh, somewhat frustrating one in that you're, you're thinking about what you actually want to accomplish when you're writing the code and then you uh, lose track of some of the details and make a sloppy mistake. So your code doesn't work and then you, you know, go and debug it and then you whack yourself over the head and say, well, that was a dumb mistake. And, um, and that was kind of the experience of, of, of programming at the time. And uh, when I started programming in Java, uh, you know, I, there, there came a point, you know, uh, after a while where I, I realized I haven't had a bug in a year. And, and this was something that was qualitatively different from almost any of the languages I had programmed in at the time that, you know, the ability to translate what I was thinking into something that was actually correct was, you know, was a revelation to me. And, it, and it's, it's, you know, it's changed my relationship with programming. And I've been programming primarily, but not exclusively in Java, you know, for the last almost 25 years. That's, that's, that's also amazing. And I, I think that's, it's great. Uh, and Mark, your memories as well. I'm, I'm sure there's some similarities there, but some unique ones as well. Uh, there are just so many memories to choose from. Um, I think, you know, like George, I, I do have many fond memories from uh, you know, going to conferences, speaking with developers, you know, get, getting feedback. Uh, it's, it's always both educational and, and invigorating. And, and I really miss it in these, in these strange times that we're in right now. But uh, probably my, my fondest memory also, also goes way back. And, and that would be, I think, in May of 1996, when I went to Sun Microsystems to interview with James Gosling and members of the original Java team. And it, it just felt like such a, a natural thing. I remember wa walking out of, out of that building thinking, wow, this is, this, is, this is the place for me to be. This is the project to work on and, 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 and the people to work with. It was, it was both sort of you know, satisfying, exciting, and intimidating, all, all wrapped up in, in, in the same thing. And not in my wildest dreams did I think that I'd still be working on it 24 years later. But, you know, it, but here I am, and it's been, it's been a ton of fun, and it's been more rewarding than I, I could have imagined, really. Yeah, you know, for, you know, for me, I'll, I'm going to cheat a bit here. Because how, how do you just pick one memory? Like, you know, for me, being able to go to the first Java 1 in 1996, I will never forget that memory. How, how was it that I was able to even go? I don't know. The fact that Sun took a chance on me and allowed me to join the team in, in uh, December of 2000 uh, still gives me shivers today. Um, but, you know, in 2010, when, when Oracle acquired Sun, you know, I, I, I had a little fear in me, but I have to say it's, uh, it's been amazing to see just how much Oracle has put in Java, both in terms of technical innovation, in terms of fostering the community. Uh, it, it's great that, you know, we're given this opportunity to, to carry it forward. And um, I, I guess I would say that every memory that I, I make moving forward is my best memory with Java. So 
Um, I want to thank all of you as panelists for sharing your time. We still have a lot more uh, to share. Um, Chad, if you could stay on, I would appreciate it. Um, but, you know, in, in these times, I think it's really important to say thank you. Uh, we all know that Java is not possible by one person, by a few people, or even by one group. It's, it's done by uh, us as the leaders and stewards. It's done by the community. It's done by users. But I, I personally want to say thank you to a lot of people. And I think it's important to actually share that uh, in these times. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to the Java Platform Group. You make coming to work a joy every day. Uh, to all of my peers in the Linux team, the Autonomous Database team, Oracle Cloud, uh, Graal VM, uh, even the uh, apps team and the events team, I appreciate all the thanks that you've uh, sent our way to the Java team, and we consider all of you part of the Java family. There's some peers at Oracle I really appreciate because you help extend the story of Java for us. And so I just want to call out some people personally, Todd Sharp, Andres Almare, Gerald Benzel, Heather Van Kira, Alan Zajcek and Jim Grizanzio, Margot Davis, Javed Muhammad, Linda Bronson, Jennifer Nicholson, and Wincy Ipe. I am thankful for all you do. And there's so many in the community I also want to say thank you to. Angie Jones and Josh Long for all you do to give Java visibility here in the Bay Area. Vincent Myers and Amelia Eras for creating inclusive events. Beyond thankful for that. My dear colleague, Cornelius Duplessis in South Africa, what you're doing to bring Java to underappreciated communities and underfunded communities uh, is beyond touching. Uh, Mala Gupta in, in India, in New Delhi, my, my mother's hometown, how you bring Java to children, thank you so much for that. Uh, David West and Raphael Winterhalter, how you've grown a vibrant community of Java developers in the Nordic region, thank you. Uh, Linda Vanderpaul, Regina Tenbruggen Kate, you founded the J Duchess program and you've brought gender inclusion into our Java community for so many years. And thank you for that. And how can I forget Heinz Kibbutz, who has taught all of us how to pull off an unconference? And then, of course, all of the Java user groups around the world, you really bring community together. The Morocco Jug, how you've raised awareness of programming in North Africa. Sue Java Jug. Bruno Souza, thank you for growing the largest Java user group in the world with over 40,000 members. The Guadalajara and Mexico City jugs, what you're doing with your humanitarian efforts is beyond commendable. The Taiwan and Singapore jug, how you're bringing Java to schools and children, thank you so much for that. And then here in the United States, whether it's in San Diego and Silicon Valley or San Francisco and Seattle in Kansas City and Atlanta, New York and uh, Orlando, all of you are investing time with users and I appreciate that. And as you can see from my shirt, the Netherlands jug, I'm wearing this specifically because you in the Netherlands have always embraced me, embraced the Java team and embraced Oracle, your family to us. And I just wanna say thank you to all of you. Um, with that, I wanted to share some details uh, that you as, uh, uh, as viewers can benefit from. So let's just quickly go back to some of that. So first off, this is one campaign, as Chad mentioned at the beginning, one campaign together. We have a lot of programs here at Oracle that will allow this campaign to be extended to you in various ways in the coming weeks, in the coming months, and uh, even into next year. So please look for, uh, for more information from these programs. Also, please follow us uh, on Twitter at Java and use the Move by Java hashtag. It'll give you a chance to share your memories, your thoughts, your ideas, and you'll also get updates as far as what new elements of this campaign are coming forward. We also have an interesting sort of fun activity where we've designed a competition called the Best of the JDK. And if you go to Java Magazine, uh, we've, uh, we've authored an article we'll, which will give you a chance to vote on your favorite features uh, in terms of your more modern Java features. Uh, we'll be deploying that on Twitter by a poll starting on May 26th. This will give you a chance to vote on the features, the modern features of Java that you are most interested in. And it'll be interesting to see which, uh, which feature comes out on top. Obviously, we don't have lambdas listed here because why have a competition 
if you list lambdas. That's my opinion. Uh, we also have a new landing page for the campaign. So oracle.com slash moved by Java. You can also stay abreast of what's happening in terms of, of, of new campaign elements that uh, we're going to be putting in play. Uh, and I'd now like to turn it over to Chad. Chad, you want to give us a little information about something new? Yeah, so thanks, Char. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Moved by Java is a year-long celebration, uh, and we have a ton of exciting activities and announcements planned. I'm thrilled to announce one of the first uh, is inside.java. That's the URL. If you go to inside.java uh, and boom, you're there. So let me explain really briefly what it is. Uh, there's an expression in American slang called inside baseball, and it dates back to, I think, the late 1800s. Um, and it's, it originally meant to represent a style of play that was less flashier, you know, bunts, uh, stealing bases, minor hits, et cetera, rather than some of the flashier tactics like home runs. Today, the expression is generally referred in a much broader sense around an interest in the details uh, of a particular subject above and beyond which, uh, what most people know. And that's really what inside.java is all about. It's about the finer details of how Java is created, uh, both the flashy and sometimes the less flashy. If you go there, you'll see that it's a content aggregator featuring blog posts, notable mailing list entries, um, conference talks, and more, uh, primarily from the folks working on Java at, at Oracle. Um, ultimately, it's about everyone in the community becoming a, a Java insider. So please check it out. Um, we're looking for feedback as well uh, and look forward to more great content uh, coming on that site. Well, for everyone that uh, joined this panel today, I really want to thank you for your time, sharing your stories, sharing your memories, sharing your ideas in terms of how you are moved by Java. So I want to thank, uh, say thank you to all of you. I also want to say thank you to all the participants for spending time with us today. Uh, I'm not sure where the next 25 years will go other than we'll go there together because truly our world is moved by Java. So thank you. Thank you, Char. Thanks, Char. Thank you so thank you, much. Everybody. Thanks, Char. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.